This is the Biblical Mind Podcast, produced by the Center for Hebraic Thought. Honest five-star reviews help others find this podcast. Visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org for articles and videos that explore the deep structures of scripture. The move was uh, pretty sudden. My parents kind of told us, but it had been like three, four years in the making because the, the reason we were able to come to the U.S. was because my mom won a lottery, a diversity lead, uh, what is it called? Diversity lottery visa. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes, it's, it is what it sounds like. It is a lottery. They pick your name randomly, but you have to go through about three years worth of vetting to make sure you're not a terrorist, to make sure you add value to the country, et cetera. Um, so we, I kind of knew what was happening, but I didn't really comprehend it because I was a child. Um, and then one night my grandparents woke us up in the middle of, of the dawn and we drove to Cairo, which was a long drive back then because there was really little to no roads, about six hours. And I, you know, said goodbye to my parents, started crying because I didn't really understand what was happening. And in true Arab fashion, I watched my mom put way too many suitcases on the spinny thing. Yeah. Um, and my mom was was young. She is young. She had me when she was 17 and t- to my two little sisters uh, shortly after. So she was 24 at the time with three children, um, mm. experiencing an airport, experiencing a city, to be quite frank, for the first time ever. Um, and then we got on the plane and we landed in JFK. My father had been here already in the U.S. trying to, you know, set up some skeleton of a life. Um, and we drove to Queens and I stood on, I, I remember it so vividly, even though it was years ago, decades ago, but it was a crooked sidewalk in Queens um, next to a Coptic church. And I remember my father telling me he had picked that street specifically because it was a quick two minute walk to the church. Hmm. Um, and that was my first impression of America. I remember seeing an elevator for the first time on my drive to Queens. And I was like, so excited. I asked my dad, like, does our building have an elevator? Like, I really want to ride on the elevator. Um, the little things, isn't it? It is the kid. little yep. things. And I was, there was no elevator in our building because it was a one story building. But, um, and I remember seeing what, what I think was a school at the time. I think it was a school and I was really excited. I was like, I really hope I get to go there. Um, and I just remember these like spotlight moments from the drive from JFK to our crappy apartment in Queens. Hmm. And that, that, those were my first impressions of America. So you said you had to drive a long way to get to Cairo. So where are you from in Egypt? Where's your family uh, from? So my family's from a province, uh, Minya, in in uh egypt uh, specifically abu Jirch, which is a really small town um up until a few years ago you couldn't find that on the map but mm. google maps finally has it now so you can, wow. you can google it yeah <laughs> uh and i assume that it's on the nile somewhere or close to the nile it is pretty much all civilization in egypt is right, right around the as, nile. as it was three to five thousand years ago it still exactly. is exactly yeah yeah yep. uh excellent and so your dad chose that street because it had a church, I assume a Coptic church. Um, yeah. And why was that so important to him? I mean, I think most people are going to think Egypt, they're going to think Muslim. So uh, why was church so important to him? Um, so I am a Coptic Christian. Uh, Coptic is a Greek word meaning Egyptian. Um, Coptic Christians are the indigenous people of Egypt, um, and they descend from pharaohs and what we know, what Westerners know as ancient Egyptians. Hmm. Um, And it's quite bizarre, or people perceive it to be quite bizarre that you think of Egyptian and Christian to be one and the same thing. But it's, I I don't know any other way to think about it because Hmm. it's what and who I am. Uh, So sometime around 70 AD, uh, St. Mark the Evangelist traveled. And please feel free to correct me here because I will probably mess something up. And you, I want to hear your version. Okay. okay. <laughs> I want to remix the story. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so sometime around 70 AD, St. Mark the Evangelist uh, traveled to Alexandria and began to preach um, and built the Church of Alexandria and built the Library of Alexandria. And because the ancient Egyptians had these pretty 
built out ideas of an afterlife and a forgiving God, they quickly began to convert to Christianity. And in the centuries that followed, Egypt became 85% Christian. Hmm. Um, and it stayed so for a couple hundred years, if my history is not mistaken. Um, and those were the Coptic Christians. And around the 6th or 7th century, when uh, the Muslim invasion happened through Arabia and Northern Africa, you were, whether you were Muslim or any other religion, you were given a choice to convert, to pay a tax, or to die at the sword. Um, and many chose to convert because they believed in Islam. Many chose to leave and go somewhere where they can be Christians freely. Um, and many chose to die at the sword, which is why the Coptic Church has so many martyrs. Um, if all of this is true, which I believe it to be, my family chose to pay a tax um, to be able to continue to be Coptic Christians freely mm. in Egypt. Um, and there's other things that you had to do. For example, at some point, the monks of the Coptic Christian Church had to wear big crosses on their chest to be able to be identified as Christians. And through centuries and through you know different movements within both the Christian Church and the Muslim movement, um, all Christians had to be able to be identifiable as Christians, which is where you get the Coptic cross tattoo on the right wrist that if you know a Copt, 99% of the chance, 99% of the time, they'll have a Coptic cross tattooed on them and we give them to our children. So mine, hmm. I was given by my mother when I was nine months old. Oh, wow. And yeah, so. And, and is that, how is that, as somebody who got a lot of tattoos when I was a teenager, yeah. um, is it tattoo gun these days or is it done with a stick and ink or what? Uh, I think mine was done with a stick in, like you yeah, literally pound it into in. the yeah, yeah poke yeah. it into the skin. Um, nowadays, I've gotten like a few back in Egypt when I go back, and they're done with like a nicer right. uh, instrument. I presume it's a professional it's gun. gun. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they're yeah. they're literally done at churches. So if you go to a big monastery in church or church in Egypt on Sunday, you'll see artists that have been doing this for generations, hmm. um, sitting outside. You know, you bring your child to them and they will give it a tattoo. In fact, Razuk's tattoo in, in Jerusalem in the old city, he's a copt that mm. has his family fled from Egypt to Jerusalem to avoid persecution, I think, the thir in the 13th century. And he's been tattooing people since then. And it's the oldest cop, to, it's the oldest tattoo shop in the world. Hmm. Um, so I assume being in New York City that you run into. Egyptians. Actually, I have a Coptic Egyptian guy who works maintenance on our building here. I've talked oh, yeah? to Zacharias. Yeah. Um, so when you run into Egyptians who are not Coptic, is there, is it like showdown at the saloon? Like, you know, like, <laughs> like you stare down each other? Or like, what's the relationship between um, Egyptian Muslims and Egyptian cops? And uh, I, I don't know what other religions are dominant in Egypt. But. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, it is not a saloon. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, it's hard to untangle what it means to be a cop from what it means to be an Egyptian. They are one and the same, mm -hmm. at least for me, they are. Um, so an Egyptian is an Egyptian is an Egyptian. So when I see Egyptians, in fact, somebody, a young Egyptian Muslim man recognized me at Trader Joe's from my show Americanish a few mm -hmm. weeks ago. And we had a very pleasant conversation about what it means to be an Egyptian in New York and what it means to be American-ish. Um, it's hard to definitively characterize what that relationship is like because it varies differently about uh, when you factor in different things like where in Egypt you're from. People from Alexandria to Cairo to Minya have vastly different relationships. In Minya, and especially in the town that I grew up in, the village I grew up in, we were one of a few Coptic families, if not one and maybe like two, three Coptic families. So um, you knew what your limits were, right? You you knew as a Christian, you were a second class citizen, you were a dimmi, although that may not be expressed verbally or otherwise. Um, you knew to kind of stay in your lane. In school, it was me and maybe three other cops. I, I was lucky enough to go to Egyptian schools up until first or second grade before we moved. And um, it was me and three other cops in the class. And we'd be with our classmates all day long. And then it would be religion class. And then we'd have to separate. 
We'd go to our room with a Coptic teacher if he showed up that day. Hmm. If he didn't, we'd stay with the Muslim children and learn Quran and learn how to pray and learn Quranic verses. Um, and you would, I mean, if, when you're kids, like, you make fun of each other. That's what kids do. And right. you'd be made fun of because you're different. I mean, kids make fun of each other for other differences, too. And this this isn't uh, an outlier. You're different in religion. And um, unlike the Western world, religion is very much present in your day-to-day -day life. You can't hide what you are. My name is Maryam, which is St. Mary's name in Arabic. Um, so you can't hide who you are. Bishoy, Kurullus, um, Andrew, John, Johanna, like all, you can tell who you are by your name. And you can't, you can't really escape that. That was that was a huge digression. Did I answer no, your no, question? No, I'm no, sorry. <laughs> well, I want to come back to another question uh, about yeah. your dad and the church. Uh, but before that, um, I, so in that classroom situation, are you known uh, as a Christian? Like, is it you're different because you're a Christian, or you're different because you're a Copt? And I don't know if that question even makes sense now that I've said it out loud. Um, no, it does. It does. I don't know if like down to the village level that. We'd have to ask a Muslim. I'm completely out of my lane here, but I don't know if they, if Muslim kids knew there were other Christians that weren't Copts. Mm. To be a Copt was yeah. to be a Christian. Yeah. I, they don't. I honestly didn't know there were like Catholics and Evangelicals. Like I had no idea. I was in my own little bubble with a thousand people, and those are the people you grow up with and you die with. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I think, I always think. Uh, for Christians who aren't in necessarily what they call the Western world, um, whether they get associated with Western Christianity, which is looks very sexualized and promiscuous and rock and roll and movies and Hollywood, and it's like, oh, that's all Christian stuff. Uh, but it doesn't sound like you got tagged with all of that as a child. No, no, thankfully not. No yeah. offense to <laughs> to the rock and rollers. No, I mean it's uh, yeah, it's it's a wild it's a wild web that we weave uh, to the rest of the world as to about what Christianity is about. Um, so your dad, he picked this uh, street because it had a church on it. So um, in his mind, is is that a safety issue or is that, you know, as we might say, a spiritual issue or uh, I want my kids to grow up in the church kind of a thing or this is a community where, I, where we will be safe? Um, okay. A few different ways to think about this. When, when, People from the West, or at least let me let me put it this way: When my father and mother thought of the West and America, they thought about uh, being promiscuous, drugs, um, Sodom and Gomorrah type stuff. Of course, but they also of thought, yeah, you got you got a <laughs> Sodom and yes. Gomorrah type. Thing. But they also thought about like I can find a job, I can send my children to school, they don't have to cover their hair because it's mandated. So it, it was a double-edged sword of this new place comes with all these opportunities for a new life, but we do have to be very careful of all the bad stuff it also comes mm -hmm. with. And I think for that reason, the church, the, sh the street with the church was picked. Um, it was also an issue of like comfortability and vulnerability. Those two go hand in hand. How vulnerable do we want to be in this new place? Um, the only English word I spoke was yes. I didn't, I didn't know no. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe my father knew a little bit more because he had been here for a couple months prior to us, but we wanted a place, this is me stepping into my parents' shoes now, they wanted a place that we would be able to communicate at least until we understood what this new environment came with. Um, those are just like the top reasons why the church, you know, why the street with the church was the obvious choice. It also comes down to... Uh, even till now, I just had the chance to go back to that church last weekend um, mm. because I was jet lagged and the mass starts at 6 a.m. So I had I had a place to go. Perfect. 6 a.m. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 6 to 1030. We are lengthy people. Um, so it, it and I saw it very clearly is this is a place where fresh immigrants come to mm -hmm. to acclimate to slowly dip their toes in the water onto what this new country is like i think people vastly underestimate what it means to immigrate and you only think about it especially immigrants when you think about like what you did years ago think about like you uprooting your entire life no education your parents barely know how to read and write um no money really nothing to fall back on 
and you just pack your life up in a few suitcases with your children all under seven or eight and just go to a new place. That sounds horrifying. And I, I am not any of those things. Like if I were to do that, th- does that sound horrifying to you? Am I-, I, I actually did that once when all my kids were under five. So yes. And I, how was it? Uh, it was hard. It was hard. It was way harder than I could have ever imagined for reasons that I could not have imagined at the time. So yeah. Yeah. And it was an English speaking country. So it wasn't even mm-hmm. a language. Well, it's Scotland. So I don't know if that counts as English speaking, <laughs> but uh <laughs> but yeah, and, and it wasn't yeah, it wasn't a tough situation. But I did spend about ten years in a in an immigrant church here in Newark, where I live, um, and I did notice that that, that it has this, that's constantly new people coming in who have never lived in the United States before, and then people kind of seem to make two basic decisions. One is we need to learn English as quickly as possible. We want to become American, American, American. Um, and then the other ones are like, oh, great. I never have to speak English if I stay in this church. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't – and like in my community, I mean you can live in my neighborhood and never speak English at all. You know, like you can get by just fine with Portuguese or Spanish uh, in my neighborhood. So um, is it the same with the cops where it's not it, – it, it's a good community where you can dip your toe and you can get adjusted to the waters? Do people – stay inwardly faced in the cult like they never really become american culturally otherwise one of both the beauties of being a cop and the downfalls of being a cop is we're highly adaptable as with all other minorities um maybe except for the jews which is something i i'm very envious of and um so the answer is no people move out of that community pretty rapidly. I think the turnaround rate is like two, three years, maybe a little bit more. Um, And the fresh batch comes in and takes their place. Um, And I think it's both admirable in that we're willing to learn the language, be part of the culture, kind of live the American dream, like you become American. Um, The downside of it is the children stop speaking speaking Arabic, which although is not a Coptic language, it is it's still a big part of Coptic identity. I believe it to be. Um, You stop partaking in, you know, your your Easter's and your Christmases on Coptic dates, and you partake in the American dates, which I'm not a fan of particularly. And you just you become too American. I think the Mm -hmm. there's a there's a art and a finesse to figuring out what parts of American culture you partake in and what parts of your native culture you want to stay true to. And that's something I'm navigating every single day because it's you want to keep the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff, right. but it's yeah. hard to be objective about all that stuff, um, especially as like a young adult trying to figure out what it means to to be two things at once. Um, yeah. Does that does that help? <laughs> no, I, I, it actually, it's it's kind of extraordinary because again, not all immigrant communities function like that. I mean, it, I saw the same thing working with immigrants in St. Louis when I was a pastor. As you'd see, the Bosnians came in and did did what the, it sounds like the cops did, is they moved out very quickly. But then you'd have other people um, who would come in and basically just form an in, inward facing community and basically never ever try to uh, become. American for for very obvious reasons, but it also became the stumbling block for the rest of their life. They're never able to speak English. They they rely on that community for every single thing, and it can be crippling in some ways. Um, so that's uh, that's interesting to hear that it, it goes that way. Do you think it's possible to like? build a consistent cyclical community that both integrates into this new culture but stays true to its roots or is that kind of impossible you have to pick a lane i have a really long answer to that question but here here would be the short answer is it depends on the nature of the immigration so the church i was in most of the immigration was illegal uh and so it meant people at 18 years old were often making lifelong decisions that meant they could never go back to their home country or at least they could never until they got legally straightened out here, which might take 10, 15, 20 years. And so then they became like this weird American. So they had to be American, but they relied in the, their own inner culture. And then they like started becoming like super home country versions of themselves. They were like, this is Brazilian in this case, but like they were more Brazilian than your average Brazilian on the street, you know, and um, because they were cut off from that culture. And so they're like trying to recapture it and all these 
um, fun and interesting ways. So I think if you, if, if there's, cause there's, there's all kinds of people who immigrate on these, uh, diversity lottery visas, you have them on the high tech people, you know, people who come in cause they have a specialty or whatever. I think that that decision that makes you pick up and move, um, kind of informs the way you're going to act in the new place possibly, or at least that's what I'm thinking. I don't know. That might not be correct. It's my own experience. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're talking at this point, we're like 15 minutes in and I bet there's people listening going like, what the heck is Coptic Christianity? <laughs> what does that even mean? Um, so if, you know, if you give the thumbnail sketch, what do you tell people when you just like, let me get you oriented to what I mean when I say Coptic? Right. Great question. And it's honestly one of the hardest questions that I've had to answer because I'm not a theologian and I can't really get into which council held when yeah, decided yeah, no, to I, separate. Yeah. But, so there are the Christological controversies about yeah. what Christ was that often determines a lot of these different how these different branches identify themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in like, you know, like the, your experience of the church, how is it different than other churches you've been to? Yeah. Yeah. So the Coptic church is, um, Oriental Orthodox, right? Not Eastern Orthodox. Am I correct about that? Sure. Yeah. No, awesome. we can go with okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so when it comes to the service, it is much more Eastern and mystical, if you will. Um, think Greek Orthodox, think Russian Orthodox, lots of icons, lots of um, incense during the mass. They, we have the, our priests wear the big funny hats, although they're blinged out during Christmas and Easter. And they have very, I, I'm just really, I've been really obsessed with clergy outfits in the past few months because I was just in Greece and oh, yeah. their outfits are not blinged out at all, at all just full black, at least mm. uh, during the weekdays, not on Sundays. Um, but they look very similar to the way a Coptic priest dress on liturgy. Uh, mm. Reds, like maroon reds, uh, gold, um, and the church is just absolutely decked out with uh, icons and, um, you know, symbols, crosses, the, the Jerusalem crosses. Um, so those are the ways that I feel like the Coptic church is different from any Western church, particularly like Catholic or evangelical church. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more hierarchy within the church. Um, so we have a different Pope than the Catholic Pope. Um, and he's in Alexandria. Um, what else? What else can I think of? Um, and the Pope there we, doesn't sit in the, exactly the same position as like the Roman Catholic Pope. So he's not like this... I mean, it's a complicated relationship, right? But it's it's more of a, the leader of the church, not necessarily the the voice of God for the church when he sits ex cathedra, um, which yeah, is not exactly absolutely. what the Pope does. <laughs> it's not a fair description of the Pope in Roman Catholicism, but yeah, it's a different relationship. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm learning that right this second that I didn't know that the the Pope spoke on behalf of God for he, for Catholics. The Pope technically can. Uh, it only has oh, happened yeah? a few times in history, but yeah. That's a pretty cool gig if you can speak <laughs> on behalf of God. <laughs> well, I mean, that's Where what the red, the red phone in the back, that's what it was for. So you can just ah, talk, talk directly. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm not making um, no. fun of you, Roman Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> I know a few uh, evangelical pastors that think they speak directly <laughs> for God. So this is... Um, no, the Coptic Pope does not speak directly for God. Um, I've heard, I think it was... It was the Greek Orthodox priest that I was, you know, hanging out with in Greece a few weeks ago. And he said that priests are not supposed to be God's representatives on earth. They're supposed to be the people's representative in front of God. Mm -hmm. During kind of taking the, the, the Levitical view of priesthood. Yes, exactly. And yeah. I, I found that to be really, really profound. And it really sat well with me because growing up there was and I'm sure this happens in other like low income communities or low income Christian countries is that there's this huge disconnect between the congregation and the priest. And mm -hmm. the priest feels like he's not, I, I can't touch him and not physically touch him, but like spiritually, he doesn't understand where I'm coming from as a human being because he's some other form of mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to get out of that headspace and I'm trying to let my priest be an advocate for me. Um, another reason that I struggle with confession, uh, is that something that Western Christians do? Do you guys have to, Roman like, Catholics to to and Eastern okay. Orthodox do? Yeah. But not, yeah. not technically Protestants. So 
No. Okay. They they believe in the practice of confession, but just not to a priest as a mm. as a sacrament. So. Right. Right. Yeah. It it is for the Coptic Church, and it's something that I've struggled with personally for forever up until now because I just. I felt like I could just talk to the big guy directly and I didn't need an intercessionist, which is Mm -hmm. completely anti-Coptic and anti-Orthodox. But I'm trying to kind of come to grips with having somebody advocate for me in front of God in a positive way Mm -hmm. and not, you know, take pity on me or look at me as a less of a Christian because of my sins. Right. Yeah, I I think you see that. I've seen that in a lot of communities even in South America where there really is this the pastor or the priest becomes sometimes up on a pedestal sometimes just mm-hmm. it's like they don't know where we are they don't know how we the yeah. normal people live uh, of course they probably all do uh, intimately because yeah. <laughs> they're humans just like us um mm-hmm. you you talked about the calendar as being important to you I don't think a lot of Christian I didn't know this until I was reading church history but that that you have basically two calendars uh, for the holidays, uh, the holy days of Christianity. Um, why is that a big deal to you? Like, why can't you just like get on board with good old American <laughs> Christmas and Easter? I'm joking, of um, course. I'm being sarcastic. No, no, that's a great question. Why can't I get on board? Um, wow, what a good question. It might be more subconscious than anything else, but it's hard for me to connect with Western Christians because the journey to becoming a Christian or understanding who you are as a person for a Coptic person is completely different than it is for a Roman Catholic who grew up in America or, uh, I don't know, Germany or or some other place. Um, I feel like you can kind of put your Christianity on a shelf when you grow up in a place that is founded on the ideals of Christianity and you can stop being a Christian whenever you want. Um, Whereas for a person that's Coptic or Assyrian or Maronite or Palestinian Christian, I just listened to your episode with my friend Khalil, yeah. a, a Palestinian from from uh, a Christian Palestinian from Gaza, from Gaza. You can't you can't shelve it. Like you have no choice but to be Christian at all times, and that comes with a lot of weight. Mm. Um, and we carry with pride because we know that's what it means to be a Christian. It means to suffer constantly, <laughs> unfortunately, but. It's not something that's, uh, you know, looked, looked to for, um, it's not something people want to be, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, so part of that, part of carrying my Christianity, carrying my cross, is knowing that my journey as a Christian is vastly different than a Roman Catholic or an evangelical or a Protestant from any part of the U.S. And I'm not saying by any means that, those Christians don't experience hardships and persecution. I'm sure they do. It's just not my experience. And my experience comes with the fact that I celebrate Christmas on the night of January 7th and Easter a week after American Christians do. Right. Um, and I, I think, I don't know, it's it's good to be different as as much as we as children and in our adolescents don't want to be different because we want to fit in. I like celebrating Christmas a week later or two weeks later, technically. Um, and we fast. So the dates matter because I don't stop fasting on January 25th, even if I want to celebrate Christmas then. You fast until... It's December 25th, just to be clear. What did I say? January 25th? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm I, all... I was just making sure that's what you meant. Because yes, I was like, yes. wow, dang, that is a fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So that's a, I'm, I'll have a better answer for you when you ask me in a month or so, but th- that's yeah. <laughs> my way of rationalizing why it's yeah. important to me. Uh, no. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm known to be a little bit of a Grinch when it comes to the American neo-pagan celebration of Christmas, <laughs> which we all have our own things. Right. But I, I do mm-hmm. wonder if you also, you escape a little bit of the, the, the heightened consumerism of Christmas as well by being on that slightly alternate date. Absolutely. To, yeah. Yeah. I get all my Christmas chocolate January like 5th. So it's all on sale. Right. <laughs> Same for Easter. <laughs> it's, it's very great when you, it's, it's just incredible when you push back everything a, a week. And I purposely try not to do gifts on Christmas to just, I, especially in the past year or two, I've just tried to look at Christmas as what it is. Mm-hmm. And it's celebrating the, birth of our Lord and Savior, and to try to escape all those little things that 
commercialism and capitalism or whatever you want to attach to it. That's although I'll I'll note the first thing you pointed out was the sales. (laughs) Oh yeah, the chocolate sales. But that's that's my way of engaging and not engaging in capitalism as well. Yeah, I I, know. I hear it, 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 and it makes sense. The the idea of being raised in a, a Christian where you have to be Christian and not on the shelf. And I think a lot of us in the West are, je- you know, weirdly jealous of like, oh my goodness, wouldn't that be great if Christians in the West never put their Christianity on a shelf and were like 100% all the time thinking about why they're devoted uh, to this particular God. Um, but then that does come from persecution. I wonder if you found some kind of like, ha- you know, we're talking about cultural assimilation, but is there some happy medium with that? Christianity on the shelf without having to endure persecution? Or do you think like, like, nope, unless you've been me and my people, you're just going to end up being one of those semi hypocritical people <laughs> who sometimes show your Christianity and sometimes you're just an American. <laughs> wow. You really boxed me in to Sorry. press somebody Sorry. off no, with this no, question. <laughs> no. no, I mean, I really wrestle with, it. I mean, it's a lot of that, like with my own kids, like you wrestle with one of the reasons I'm pretty good with money is because we didn't have it when I was a kid. And so I mm-hmm. kind of dedicated to like, not ever like my gas and my electric and my water is never going to get turned off for my kids. But, mm-hmm. but then my kids grow up thinking that that stuff just always happens. Right. So, right. um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of an internal struggle for me of like, how much you struggle does inform who you are as a person and, and like, should Christians be submitting themselves to a little bit more struggle, I guess. That's a really good question. Um, so back to my earlier point about like in the near East, you can't escape religion, whether it be your name or the the prayer five, five times a day, you hear the, you hear the mosque on the Mm -hmm. microphone Mm -hmm. telling you it's time to pray and the church bells and that was one of the biggest culture shocks coming to America. And I still experience it when I go back to the Near East for an extended period of time and I come back here and it's like, where's the mosque or where's the church bells ringing? Um, I I don't know how to wrestle with like, should that be implemented in the West? Should we have like constant reminders of God? Because the whole point of a secular nation is that you get to do that on your own time. Mm-hmm. So it is it is a give and take. Like, do you sacrifice a secular nation or if you believe that's the right thing to do if if you want a secular nation do you sacrifice the constant reminders of god and then have a population that is up to them when they want to think of god or do you constantly remind your civilization and your citizens of god but you only get like a handful of choices. You really mm-hmm. only get one choice. You can only right. remind them of one God. You can't be reminding them constantly of like their their menu picks of right. which God right. do you choose. Um, so that's something I, I'm struggling to like come to grips with. Do you constantly remind them or not remind them at all and leave it up to them to remind themselves and put the du- put the the responsibility on the duty on your citizens to be reminded of God. And I think as I'm talking right now in the past two seconds of thought I've given it. (laughs) Um, I think it has to be like, you have to let your citizens, you have to let the civilization come to terms with who it is. And they'll have, they'll, they'll, they'll pendulum swing. They'll have times where they're constantly reminded of God and you'll see it come to fruition in the way the country operates. And you'll have times where it swings so far away from any semblance of believing in a God and again, you'll see that come to fruition in the way the society operates. Um, yeah. It's a it's a big burden to put on people. Yeah, and I think you know, as a society, it's hard for us. To, we we like I don't think we can make any of these choices. But as Christians, I feel like uh, Dr. Phaedra Shapiro, which I'm sure you know her as well, um, out of the Felix Project. But she she's written a couple times that. You know, Christians. One thing Christians could stand to learn from Jews is Jews know what it's like to be weird, um, and and they're all everything they do is weird to Christians in the West, and that Christians uh, could probably appropriate some of that. Uh, be weird and be okay with being weird in the Western culture. I hmm. I like the Northeast a little bit more because people, you know, where people stand. Like, like people hmm. don't fake Christianity as much <laughs> in right. the Northeast. Uh, if you've ever been in the Bible Belt, you know, like. They say if you go into the South, you know, if you want to figure out who's a Christian, uh, just say, all right, let's pray. And, the, you know, the hats come off and uh, <laughs> everybody loves Jesus and their mom, you know. But um, mm-hmm. but that shelving shelving your Christianity becomes the big problem in, in those cultures. And you have a version of that in every part of the country. 
Um, okay, we're not going to solve that problem. No. Um, Better people have tried. Yes. So when uh, a final question, when you say I'm an Egyptian, um, what's the most important part of your Egyptianism for like the part that like we can't we can take you out of Egypt, but we can never take this out of you? There is a great book called The Arab Mind. Mm. I think it's Robert Kaplan, but I don't want to be quoted on that. I think Do you know correct. who it is? I think you're right. Am I? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's just a certain way that the Near East, the part that I hold so true and close to my heart, operates that I have not kind of seemed to fa- find anywhere in the West. And I don't know if it's religion. I don't know if it's tribalism. I don't know if it's a combination of the both, both of them. But there's just a way that an Arab mind operates that's so different than anything else. Um, and I think that part of me is the part that I hold, the, like the most important part of, of what being an Egyptian means, in addition to being a Copt. Right. That's the caveat. Yeah. And uh, because America has this strength in its immigrant community, like mm-hmm. immigration is part of our strength. Um, do you feel like that gives you a strategic advantage in some ways? Like that you're thinking and and you see things that other people don't see? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's hard not to. Like, I couldn't stop if I tried to. Um, I was just talking to Robert, my boss, about this one time I was forced into a situation where I had to translate something from Arabic to English on the spot. And what I was translating made, like, perfect sense in Arabic. It was not (laughs) gruesome or violent or anything. And as I'm, like, translating it into English, I realize what I'm saying is completely absurd to to an English-speaking audience. And, like, what am I saying? These words should not be said out loud. They're, like, inner thoughts that you think but never would have the balls Uh, to say out loud. And I think that is is a great example of, like, being able to switch on and off between right. languages, between thought processes. There's also a last thing and then I'll shut up. Uh, somebody said to my boss as well, he was just telling me about this. Um, he said, an Arab man said to him, you Americans are the only people who mean what you say. And I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Nobody else in the world actually means what they say except Americans. <laughs> and it really tells you all you need to know about how, how different cultures and different people think and how they communicate. Yes. I, I did. I, a guy I worked with in Scotland, he, that's the one thing he loved. He worked with lots of corporations around the world. And he said, Americans, if there's a problem, you just like directly talk about it. You put it on the table. <laughs> you say, what's wrong with this thing? And they move and you know, and British culture drove him crazy because it would often, they'd say things, but it was all passive and kind of working around the issue, but never really talking about the thing uh, that was the problem. Yeah. Around. Um, well, Mariam Wahaba, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to coming back to you with harder questions about, <laughs> about Coptic Christianity. Um, and I want to mi- wish you just in advance a Merry Christmas. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. All right. You've been listening to the Biblical Mind Podcast, exploring the deep structures of Christian scripture, For more, visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org. Subscribe to this podcast at all the usual places so you never miss an episode. 